May the Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's command. What then is this bleating of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? It's true that the army spared the best of the sheep and cattle, but they're going to sacrifice them to the Lord your God. We have destroyed everything else. The Lord has anointed you King of Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission and told you, go and completely destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, until they are all dead. Why haven't you obeyed the Lord? But I did obey the Lord. I carried out the mission he gave me. I brought back King Agag, but I destroyed everyone else. Listen! Obedience is better than sacrifice, and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's true. I've disobeyed your instructions and the Lord's command. I was afraid of the people and did what they demanded. Now please, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. I will not go back with you. Since you have rejected the Lord's command, he has rejected you as King of Israel. <laughs> Thus the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today, and has given it to someone else, one who is better than you. Lord, we just thank you for your presence and your grace. We thank you, Lord, for ministering to our hearts today, Lord. We pray that we would hear your voice, that you would give us revelation, that we will encounter you in this word, Lord. You have something to say to us about worship, Lord, that will touch our hearts. And we pray that you open our eyes to see what we need to see. Lord, give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you, the spirit of understanding and insight and awareness, Lord, that each of us would hear from you, hear from heaven. We pray for your angels to surround this room. And we pray that you'll fill this place, Lord, with your heavenly creatures. And, Lord, create a spiritual atmosphere where we can encounter your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody says? Amen. Amen. amen and amen. So we are starting on worship. It's funny. Three years ago, when we thought about this series, The Meeting Place, it was a very intimidating series. <laughs> There's some things that are, that are easy and straightforward, and then some things that are intimidating. This was a very intimidating series. Because you, you, any, anything that you, you've heard people preach before, and they preach it really, really well, and you're like, what exactly am I going to say here? <laughs> I'm like, well, where are we going to get any messages from? And if you think prayer was intimidating, worship is a whole different level. And God is like, we are going to nail worship in 2019. And we're going to go step by step. Our series, The Meeting Place, developing a culture of prayer, Worship and intimacy with God. And today's message is worship is sacrifice. The core scripture for this entire series. First the place, then the presence. Exodus 40 verses 1 to 4. Let's read it together after 3, 2, 3. Then the Lord said to Moses, set up the tabernacle on the first day of the new year. Place the ark of the covenant inside and install the inner curtain to enclose the ark within the most holy place. Then bring in the table and arrange the utensils on it. And bring in the lampstand and set up the lamps. Verse 34 to 35. Let's read it. Then he hung the curtains forming the courtyard around the tabernacle and the altar. And he set up the curtain at the entrance of the courtyard. So at last Moses finished the work. So let's keep going. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could no longer enter the tabernacle because the cloud had settled down over it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So when God instructed Moses to build the tent of meeting, it was the first step in the process of hosting his presence. And God's word to us is to set this place apart as his meeting place. And our assignment is to put the spiritual structure together. Once that is complete, he will show up in his glory. Five pillars of the meeting place. What are the five pillars that the Lord gave us? What's number one? Prayer, number two, worship, number three, the word, number four, fellowship, number five, intimacy. And worship comes from the word shakor. This is Hebrew. 
and it means to depress, to prostrate, especially to be flexive in homage to royalty or God. To bow yourself down, to crouch, fall down flat, humbly beseech, do make obeisance, do reverence, make the stoop, worship. That is what we are talking about for 2019. It's all about worship in 2019. Yes. That's what we're going to talk about. There's a lot of topics we can talk about and God is like, 2019, you get one. You got one job. I need to worship. You all got one job. What's our job? Worship. worship. 2019. And he said, worship is. Last week we started with the first thing. What is worship? Obedience. What else is it? Sacrifice. What else? Offering. What else about it? Spiritual. Worship is what? Truth. Worship is warfare. Worship is freedom. And worship is service. Again, the eight dimensions of worship the Lord gave us. Just study. I'm sure there's probably 25. If you're a Bible scholar, you could tell me there's 26. Go for it. Yes. We are going to do eight. Worship is, what's number one? Obedience. Number two, sacrifice. Number three, offering. Number four, spiritual. Number five, truth. Number six, warfare. Number seven, freedom. Number eight, service. So for eight weeks, we are going to talk about worship, about what worship is. We're going to talk about what worship is. And today we're going to talk about the second thing worship is. It's obedience. That was last week. Anybody learn anything last week? Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. This week we're going to talk about what worship is. Worship is sacrifice. Mm -hmm. It's obedience. It's sacrifice. Everybody ready to talk? Yes. Let's do this. Go back to the law of first mention. Genesis 22 verses 4 to 6. Genesis 22 Verses 4 to 6. Let's read it together after 3, 2, 3. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. So, when Moses, Moses, Moses had nothing to do this. When Abraham decided to take his son to go worship, what was he going to do with his son? Sacrifice him. So, he looked at, and last week, we looked at the dimension of, he was going there to obey God. And this week, we are also looking at, he was going there to sacrifice his son. And all of that, he called worship. Because if a man's saying, I'm going up the hill to worship, I'm thinking, where's the guitar? Where are your drums? And he's like, no, 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 no. This is my worship. I'm going to obey God and I'm going to sacrifice. Yes. That is my worship. Yes. And that's the law first mentioned. The first time you see the word worship, a man is going to obey God, a man is going to sacrifice. So worship is sacrifice. The first time the word worship appeared in scripture was in Genesis 22, 5. As Abraham prepared to obey God, which we talked about last week, by offering his son Isaac as a sacrifice. So due to the law first mentioned, Abraham's actions epitomize true worship. Worship is sacrifice. But true worship costs something. True worship costs something. Yes. Second Samuel Chapter 24, verses 18 to 25. True worship costs something. There's a cost attached to truly worshiping God. Mm -hmm. I know it's true. Yes, God gave us everything. He wants nothing from us. Yes, everything's free. Salvation's free. Everything's free. I know. Mm -hmm. And it still costs something. Yes. You know, I told a guy at work, you know, he burns sometimes. Let him burn. So, you know, I was telling him, you know, I, I, was, I was a buy one, get one free. Where they, they hired me for one job, but they got, got me to do two jobs. And he's like, well, nothing's free. I was like, you know, it's true. I shall let Mikhail pay me more. 2 Samuel 24, 18 to 25. Nothing's free. Even worship. Worship costs us something. Let's read 2 Samuel 24, verses 18 to 25. After three, two, three. And God came that day to David and said to him, Go up, erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aranua the Jebusite. So David, according to the word of God, of God, went up as the Lord commanded. Now Aruana looked and saw the king and his servants coming toward him. So Aruana went out and bowed before the king with his face to the ground. 
Then Aruna said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, To buy the threshing floor from you, to build an altar to the Lord, that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. Now Aruna said to David, Let my lord the king take and offer up whatever seems good to him. Look, here are oxen for burnt sacrifice and threshing implements and the yokes of the oxen for wood. Then the king said to Aruna, No, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. Nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with that which cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord heeded the prayers for the land and the plague was withdrawn from Israel. So David went and did a census of the people. He wanted to count how many people he had. See how powerful Israel had become. And God had already told him, I don't want you to do that. But, you know, sometimes we get, we get excited and we go do what we want to do. And he went and he counted the people. And he's like, oh, wow, yes, whoa, we are so strong now. And God was like, all right, you don't listen to me. Here's a plague. And he just started wiping people out. And David was like, whoa, 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 what's with, all, what's with all the wiping people out thing? Slow down with all of that. And God was like, uh, nope, you didn't do what I told you. And he sent, and you know how God likes to send these death angels? He sent one of those death angels with a sword. And he was just wiping people out one after the other, one after the other. And he was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And he was like, all right. A prophet named Gad came to David and said, and David always had these prophets. So he used to give him advice. Thank God for those prophets. Because, I mean, he, could, he, would have been, he, he, be, he used to be in some situations. And the prophets used to come through big time. This prophet came and was like, look, go sacrifice before the Lord. So it will stop. Because he gave God a deal. He's like, God, hey, what are my options here? Considering this, and God gave him an offer. Hey, here are the things I can do to punish you. And he got to choose his own punishment. It's like a parent telling a child, here's what I can do. I can beat you, or you could stay home for the next six months, or, and you're like, I don't know, let me pick, let me pick. You know, so I'll take the licks, and I can get up and go out after. He actually told God what his punishment was, because God gave him options for punishments. All right, here are your punishments. Which one do you want? And he's like, uh, let me see. And he picked his punishment. And this is what was going on. And God's wiping people out, right? And then God was like, well, do this. Sacrifice before the Lord. He goes to the threshing floor to do the sacrifice. And he's the king, of course. So he goes to that guy and says, hey, I want to use your threshing floor to do the sacrifice. And like any good subject, he was like, you can have it. He's like, no, 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 no. I can't go sacrifice to the Lord some free thing. That's right. You know, that would be your sacrifice. That's not my sacrifice. Right. You give it to me so I can't go give it to the Lord. Like the Lord can't tell that I get it for free. Yeah. You know, he's like, I can't give the Lord what costs me nothing. David said, I will not give to the Lord what costs me nothing. And said, in, in other words, David is saying, if I'm going to give God something, there must be some value attached to it, to me at least. Hallelujah. It needs to be valuable to me. Exactly. Is that what I'm saying? Because that threshing floor was valuable to God. Yes. If you give it to me free, I don't care. I can just give it to God easy. Mm -hmm. It needs to have value to me. Mm -hmm. So he's like, I'm going to pay you something. So there is some value attached to me. So when I give it to God, it is me giving God something. Yes. Mm -hmm. Not me giving God somebody else something. Yes. Yes. Is what I'm saying? That's why when I was growing up and my man used to give me money to give an offering. After a while, they'll be like, okay, you need to get your own money. Is that, even though I gave it to you, and there's like second degrees of separation, but there must be a degree of separation because it needs to turn into you giving God an offering. Yes. Is that what I'm saying? It needs to cost you something. What are you giving up so you can give this to God? Hallelujah. Everybody understands that? Because David understood that. There must be value attached to what I'm giving to God. That's why you can't give God rubbish. That's why in the Old Testament, when they talk about tithes and all these things, you couldn't go and just give him the first fruit, and the first fruit was the worst fruits that you have because he's going to throw it away anyway might as well give it to God he's like it doesn't work like that yeah. you have to give him something that has some value attached to it that's why when we decide you know what no I know what I'm going to do I'm going to take all the best hours of my day all the best hours of my week and give it to everybody else and then whatever's left to God. God's going to get that the remnants the scraps the crumbs of your life that's what we like to do to her eh? the best days of your life you're living for the, for the world. And then when you're old and you're done and you give up everything and you can barely move, I want to serve Jesus. <laughs> Which is fine. At least you're going to get into heaven. Yes. But God's looking at you like, really? 
You give me the last 10 years of your life? No, oh, goodness. You took the first 80 to do whatever. And give the devil 80. And then you give me. When you can barely walk and your back hurts and your stuff, he's like, well, God, I'm ready for you now. You know what I'm saying? Which we like to do. When God's like, oh, would somebody give me your youth? Give me your best days? The days when you wish you could have done all other stuff? He's like, nah, I'm giving that up to give it to the Lord. Wow. Well, can I give God, the, 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 when I'm peaking, I'm not peak years. The years when I could be having fun and doing whatever I want. God's like, serve me during them years. Amen. Give me those years. Yes, you know, the years when you're looking good, you have to do the right thing them days. Yes. Later on, you, you, uh, I wait to settle down. Settle down what? Because <laughs> like, what happened to 20 years ago when he was hot and popping? Why didn't give me those years? Hallelujah. He's like, worship has to cost you something. Right. Huh? Mm. When you wake up in the morning, that's your best time and your brightest. Mm. That's when he wants you to show me. Show me that I'm for real. Read our scripture for a minute. Mm -hmm. Give me a quick little scripture. G give me that. Yeah. I want that part of the day. Mm -hmm. Give me something there now. Yeah. I know you want it. I know everybody else need it. But give me something at the beginning there. Uh, why we give why we give him Sunday? Sunday is you know how precious Sunday is. You know when you know, especially if you're working hard all week and Saturday and I'm doing something and you're like, oh Lord, Sunday, Sunday. He's like, give me Sunday. You're like, oh gosh, I want Sunday. If I could just roll over on Saturday night and get Sunday. And God's like, no, that's what I want. I want Sunday. Huh? You can leave everybody else sleeping. Everybody else sleeping, and you're like, I gotta give him Sunday, boy. Because it cost me something. Worthy. When I had to get up on Sunday and go there, it cost me something. I wanted, but I was like, no, it's yours. Huh? It cost me something. Yeah. Hello. That's why even tithes is 10%. Where he's like, you know what? Jesus. The more you get, I want a little more. Because it must never get to the point where it will cost you something. 10% of everything you feel. You know what I'm saying? When I used to make a little bit of money, 10%, I felt it. I start making more 10% of that, you feel it still. At no point when you not feel it. He's like, it's still 10%. I don't care how much you're making, give me 10%. You still have to feel, get a little pinch. I mean, it's it hurting you. But you can feel the pinch. You're like, mm, okay, I can feel it. He's like, it, it had a cost. Somebody say, worship had a cost, or something. You see, David valued God. So he insisted on offering God only what cost him something. The more you value someone or something, the more you would be willing to sacrifice. I said, the more you value someone or something, the more you'll be willing to sacrifice. I used to love Pastor Dollar. He used to always say, let me see your checkbook and let me see your calendar and I know what you value. Where are you spending your money and where are you spending your time? And you have to ask yourself, what do I value? Who do I value the most? I'm giving them my time. I'm giving them my money. Easy. You never tell me nothing. Just give me the bank statement. Give me the calendar. I can look at both. I can tell you what matters in your life. Right. You never tell me nothing. Don't talk. Show me the schedule. Show me the bank account. When you set your heart to be a true worshiper of God, you have to be prepared to give God whatever he asks for. Including what's valuable to you. There's a reason why God asks what's valuable to you. Not because he's wicked. And of course, be like, oh gosh, God, you want that too? He's like, it's, the only reason why I'm asking you for anything like that is because I just need to understand that you value me. Because he's the kind of God who will give it to you right back. He just needs to know that you value him enough to give him what he asked for. Abraham, give me the son, I promise you. You couldn't have children, and I, you finally get one. That's the right one. Give him to me. And God's like, all right. Abraham's like, no problem, I'll give you. And he's like, cool. Now that I know that you value me enough to give me what matters to you, you can have him. Another thing we don't understand sometimes. If God has asked you for something, does he really need it in heaven? He does not. He just needs to, he need you yeah. to demonstrate that you're serious. He'll give you right back. Amen. Like, who goes broke from tithing? Like, boy, I tithe until I'm broke. That doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. If I'm tithing, God knows how to give me back whatever I need. Amen. Like, anybody give you a story about, yeah, I tithe until I was broke. You're like, something about that story is sketchy. There's details you're leaving out. 
and you are focusing on one aspect of your life, tell me a little bit more about your life because there's some details you're leaving out because the tithing is not what brain you broke. Yes. Something else did. And you are using the fact that you tithed yes. as causation for your messed up life. Stop that. I was like, I'm sure there's more to the story. Because you can't go broke doing what God tells you to do. Amen. Which is why if God asks you for something, you know God owns everything. Give it to him. It's a wink, wink. Give it to me, wink, wink. You understand what he means by give it to me, wink, wink. Give it to him. Because he's either going to give you something better or he's going to give it right back to you. Just give him, wink, wink. He asks you for something, wink, wink. Give it to him. He does not need it. You're the one who needs it, and he knows that. Abraham, give me your son, wink, wink. He gave him his son, here's your son back. I just needed to know that you value me. Everybody gets that? Can't be worshiping God and not be willing to sacrifice, to give him what matters to him. Let's talk about the woman with the alabaster. And that's what we're going to sit on today. The woman with the alabaster. Luke 7 verse 36 to 50. Luke 7 verse 36 to 50. Let's read this together on the screen. After 3, 2, 3. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil. So here is Jesus at the Pharisee's house. And this woman, who is a sinner, and is not just a sinner, but is known as a sinner, because a lot of us be sinners and nobody knows. She's a sinner and everybody knows she's a sinner. She finds out he's at the house. She goes and she gets an alabaster flask of fragrant oil. I go in and find Jesus. Everybody gets that? Let's keep reading. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she's a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, Teacher, say it. So here you have the Pharisee looking at Jesus, looking at the woman. The woman shows up with this alabaster, and this woman decides... You know, I am going to go pour this on Jesus, etc. We missed a piece there. I'm going to go pour this on Jesus. And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. This woman is a sinner. And you know what Pharisees are? I'm spotless white. And she comes in here with all her sin. Now, he didn't say anything. He said it in his head. And Jesus, who reads minds, read the man's mind. I mean, that, that's an uncomfortable place to be. You can't even think it. He's like thinking, I can't believe Jesus. Like, oh, uh, Jesus answered. The man didn't say anything to Jesus. Jesus just answered. He's like, mm, I heard what he said. And he said to him, and up to now, they wouldn't call the man name. Eh? They call him the Pharisee. Jesus go and call the man name out. Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. Let's read. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose, the one whom he forgave more. Why did Jesus tell these stories? Because he simplifies things. Because you know it's really easy to respond to a story because it's not you. You can't talk about some creditor. That's why it was so easy for David to talk about the guy who took the man's lamb when Nathan came to him. There was a king, there was this rich guy who took this man's lamb. Wow, wicked. He's like, yo, I'll take him and I will kill him. He's like, right, right, you are that man. Same thing Jesus did. He tells you stories. He didn't call a man out like that. He just tell him a story. He's like, so which, which one you think will, will love the person more? The one who's forgiven of a little bit or the one who's forgiven of a lot? And he said, well, I, I, I suppose... The one who he forgave more. Now the lady's still there. Then in front of everybody. Call the man out. Everybody's watching like, hmm. Good conversation here. Keep going. And he said to him, let's go. You have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, 
but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. So here is Jesus calling them out. He's like, I know what you're thinking. He said, let me tell you a story. And you know once he's having the story time, you're like, oh boy, here we go. He's like, yeah. Which one you think will love him more? He's like, well, the one who forgiven the most. Cool, cool. This woman. So the woman's right there. Everybody's quiet. He's the kind of Simon. He's the kind of woman. He's like, you know, I came into your house and you didn't even give me water for my feet. Back in those days, the place was dirty. They had sandals. The first thing you'd always do is wash your feet with vessels of dishonor. The dirty vessel in the corner with the water in it, it's for washing people's feet. And here is Jesus Christ of Nazareth in your house. And you ain't even give the man a little water to wash his feet. And then he says, but this woman uses her tears to wash my feet. And then instead of you giving me a little cloth, a little cloth, a little dirty cloth from the corner. Because, you know, no man gives you no nice cloth, a little dirty cloth. She used her hair to wipe my dirty feet that she washed with her tears. I mean, look at the man like, really? You would even think about her? Let's keep going. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. So here's the comparison. You didn't kiss me on my cheek or my forehead. She has not ceased to kiss me on my feet since she came in. My feet. She didn't try to kiss me on my cheek, my feet. Keep going. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. You wouldn't put oil on my head. She has put oil on my feet. Then here's what he says. Let's read it. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. You're here. Your life is perfect. You're so super smart. You're so good. You're so holy. You don't care about me. You ain't give me no water. You ain't kiss my forehead. It's for you, it's just showtime. Jesus is my Jesus in my house. Jesus in my house. I invite him to eat food. You didn't care about Jesus himself. Because he came in the house and you didn't care. You just had him come in arbitrary, arbitrary, sit down arbitrary. And look at how this woman has been valuing Jesus. And he's like, this woman, all her sins forgiven. She didn't talk yet. Let's keep going. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The woman didn't talk yet. She has not said a word. She has not said a word. Because a lot of times we focus on the alabaster and say, Man, that alabaster, the box itself, is so valuable. And then you say, All right, if I want to be deep, I could say, Not just the box. But the perfume in the box is so expensive. But none of that compares to the most expensive gift, which was her pride. Hallelujah. You walk in here in front of all these holier than thou people. It costs you your reputation Jesus. to give all your reputation. Even, I mean, forget the alabaster. Think of your pride. And I know they're scoffing at me and they're looking at me funny. And you walk beeline to Jesus' feet. To practically embarrass yourself. Cry all over the man. Slob all over the man. You're here wiping the man's feet with your hair. That is a very embarrassing situation. If you had pride, you have given them all up to do that. So that caused her her reputation. Like she's like, you know what? I don't care how I look. I don't care who says what about me. I am going to worship yes. Jesus. And I'm going to worship Jesus in a very undignified way. Because I know I need Jesus to come true for me right now. I know I'm broken. I know I need a miracle. I need restoration. I will do whatever it takes. And Jesus was like, that? That? You giving up your pride? giving up your public image and your reputation, yeah. plus you spend whatever little money you had to give me the perfume in the alabaster box. You take your hair to wipe his feet. His feet were dirty. Like, it looks magical if you try to look at it from a, you know, if, if I'm doing a play or something. It would just look, it would look beautiful. But in reality, he was walking in the dirty street. 
She just messed up her hair. Because you can't cry that much to wash his foot clean. His foot was still dirty. You know what I'm saying? All she did was wet it with her tears. And just mess up her hair. Wiping his dirty feet. That is what she gave up. She's like, I don't care if I mess up my hair. If I mess up my reputation. If I give up everything for this man. To mix dirt with perfume. Because she was throwing the perfume and mixing it with the dirt. And her tears and salty tears. I mean, it was not as beautiful as we imagine. Oh, it's so beautiful. It looks beautiful if you imagine it in a play or something. If I was going to do it on TV, I'd make it look so beautiful. But in reality, his feet were extra dirty. He didn't have any socks and shoes and stuff. I mean, that is a lot. That was the sacrifice she gave him. He was like, I don't care what you've done. You just been forgiven. He's like, those who forgive him much love much. He's like, I don't care what you did. Let them scoff. In fact, let me call him out. Yo, you didn't do anything. You not forgiven. She forgiven. And you're the one who's white as snow, who's so special. She's the one who's just gotten saved. He's like, she just got saved. She didn't even open her mouth yet. He was like, you've done so much. You have, you've said. Like, I was listening to Daddy last night, and he said, when people talk about language, people talk about the written word, the spoken word. But he's like, you know what? Your body language is also a way of speaking. And she spoke. She said, forgive me. With her attitude. She said, I repent with her attitude. She confessed that I'm a sinner with her attitude. And he was like, forgiven, forgiven, forgiven. Restored, you're saved. See you in heaven. Go in peace. He said, come on. This woman demonstrated how much she valued Jesus with her extravagant worship. Not only did she sacrifice to buy the fragrant oil, which she used to anoint his feet, she also washed Jesus' feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. She was all in for her worship, and it moved Jesus' heart. Somebody say she was all in. She was all in. She was all in. You all remember? You remember what she did before she got to Jesus, which meant... How she looked and all that stuff was important. And she did not care on that day. She was like, I'm going to get my restoration and redemption. I'm going to get my healing. I'm going all in in this worship. Everybody understands that? Let's talk about the sacrifice that pleases God. The sacrifice that pleases God. Hebrews 13, 15 to 16. Hebrews 13, 15 to 16. The sacrifice that pleases God. Who wants to give God a sacrifice that pleases Him? Worship is sacrifice, and I need to make sure my sacrifice pleases God. Let's read Hebrews 13, 15 to 16. After three, two or three. Therefore, by Him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. But do not forget to do good and to share. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So I am being told here, yes, or for the sacrifice of praise. Yes, that is the fruit of your lips. Yes, giving thanks to his name. So yes, praise and worship, yes. If I want to talk about the sacrifice of praise, yes. Beat the drums and sing, yes. Say, Lord, I praise you. Lord, I worship you. Yes, but, somebody say, but. He put it right there. In case you think it's just the words. In case you think it's just, I want you to bring a sacrifice of praise. Lord, I praise you. Lord, I praise you. Yes, but. Keep going. Do not forget to do good and to share. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Yes, give him the song. Yes, give him the words. But do not forget the actions. Do not forget to do good and share. He's like, don't just come up and sing for me. I love it. I love the singing. I didn't tell you, don't, don't sing. Don't just say, Lord, I worship you. He wants you to say, Lord, I worship you. Don't stop that. 
Don't be like, well, I don't say, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think praise in church anymore. I'll do it by my actions. He didn't say either or. He said, and give me the song, give me the words, and do not forget to do good. And to share because those are the sacrifices that he actually is pleased with. If I want to give God a sacrifice that pleases him, it needs to be a sacrifice of my actions. Everybody gets that? I need to do good. Look at your name and say, do good. And share. God wants us to open our mouths and give him praise. Regardless of what's going on in our lives. That's the sacrifice of praise. Yes, he wants the sacrifice of praise. Our praise is a valuable sacrifice. Yet, what really pleases God is when we do good and share his love with others. Yes, sacrifice and give God praise in the midst of whatever you're dealing with. But do more than that. Do good. Share his love. Everybody understands that? If I want God to be pleased in my sacrifice, I have to do more than just say, Lord, I worship you. Lord, I praise you. I got to do good. Somebody say, do good. good. Don't just say good. But there's a sacrifice God wants. There's a sacrifice God wants. Psalm 51 verses 15 to 17. Psalms 51 verses 15 to 17. The sacrifice God wants. Let's read it after three, two, three. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in birth offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. If I want to give God a sacrifice, I guarantee he'll accept. I give him a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. What do I mean? I'm humble. I'm open. I'm broken open. I'm humble. I'm passionate. I empty myself before God. I lower myself. I raise him up. Broken open. No walls up. I show up to God completely open. Completely humble, completely passionate, desirous for him. Everybody gets that? Worship is sacrifice. But the sacrifice God wants is your heart. Broken, humble, and repentant. You show up to God humble and repentant. Because compared to him, you are nothing. You don't show up to God with swag. You leave his presence with swag, but you don't show up to his presence with swag. You come to his presence humble. You come to worship, you have no reputation, you come to love him. When you're done, you have swag. Because you got it from him. But you can't come to him with it. You know what I'm saying? He's like, if you want to sacrifice to me, nothing touches Somebody shows up to me with an open, humble, repentant, broken heart. He's like, that I do not despise. He'll always take that. That's a gift. You'll always be like, yo, whoa, whoa, whoa. Give me that gift. He'll always take that gift. Everybody understand that? So what will you sacrifice? What will you sacrifice? Romans 12 verse 1. Romans 12 Verse 1. Let's read this together. After 3, 2, 3. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, dedicating all of yourselves, set apart as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to God, which is your rational, logical, intelligent act of worship. What does this mean? It means I'm giving him everything. If I say I'm going to give him my body as a living sacrifice, what does that mean? I'm jumping on the altar. I'm not coming to the altar and putting something on it. Because there's one thing to say, I am going to get something valuable. And when I get to that altar, I am going to put on that altar something of value. Let me go look around the house and get something of value and put it on the altar. 
And that's going to blow God's mind. Because I gave him something that's valuable to me. Or, Paul says, you know what he wants? He wants you to jump on the altar. God, here is my sacrifice. Me. I'm on the altar. In other words, he's like, here's what I want. Everything. He wants what? Everything. Everything. He come and he's showing up like, yo, so uh, let's, just, let's determine what I want for offering. Let me think. Let me think. Everything. But what do you mean everything? Yeah. Everything. everything. He's like, this is all mine. Give me everything. Give me your life. Which is why, as I said, I know, you know, but when you're young and you're coming up and you're living your life, you're like, well, you know, when I get older, I'll get serious. He's like, that's not everything. Don't give me, don't give me what's left. You know, I done worked. I done made my money. I travel. I had all of my fun. I did everything I wanted. And then I was like, all right, now let me serve the Lord. He's like, not good enough. What are we doing? And you want, me, you want, you want, a, you want a reward for that? He's like, I want every, somebody say everything. This life is not my own. I'm living for him, which means if he says go left, I go left. If he says go right, I go right because I'm living for him. Everybody understands that? Hello. The best sacrifice you can offer to God in worship is your life. Jesus died for you so that you could live for him. Stand on your feet. Say this after me. Say, Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for 2019 being a year that's all about worship. And today, I pledge to sacrifice what matters to you. I give you my heart. I give you my mind. I give you my soul. I give you all of me. Because I understand true worship costs me something. And I'm willing to pay the price to be a true worshiper. I want you to be looking for me, to be seeking for me, because you seek the true worshipers. And I declare, this year, I will make adjustments. I'll make the right decisions. I'll make the changes in my life to ensure that my life is a life of worship unto God. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. So even right now, we're going to take two, three minutes as you prepare your offering to sit down and hear from God. God's going to ask you for something. What does He want from you? What does He want? What does He want? What is it that God wants from you? What's He looking for? He's going to talk to you. And let's make a decision to give Him what He wants. Take a couple of minutes.